Hello, everybody. Hello. Happy March 10th. Happy Wednesday. Happy Women's History Month. And it's great to see you all coming into this room to sing on yet another day in our 300 and something day of the Daily Antidote of Song, rapidly approaching April 5th, which is going to be our one year mark of having sung together in this room with so many of you coming in day after day to sing and to build community and to smile at each other. That's our cue, everybody smile. Very nice. All right, now everybody like get really close to your camera and smile, ready? There you go. All right, that is awesome. How fun to get to see you all again today and to be here in a day that at least in the Tacoma Park region is beautiful, sunny, spring-like and full of hope. And uh, what better way to spend our Full of Hope Wednesday than with these two fabulous women we're gonna be singing with today. I wanna to say hi to everybody out there on Facebook Live. Thank you for jumping into the Daily Antidote of Song today and hello to all the glorious women in this room and all of the glorious men in this room and all of the glorious uh, folks in this room of different genders. We are just so pleased that you are all here today. Jean, hello, nice to have you today. And Peggy, hello, nice to have you. I will come back to both of you. Aaron, thank you so much for running the tech today. And here we go, rolling out the hellos. Hello to Sai Khan. We're so glad to have you in the room today with us. Hello to Arlene in California and Gay. Hello, nice to see you. Sandy in the Yukon, hello. Becky in Vancouver, hello. Sue in California, Susan in Ohio, Renata in Wisconsin, Dally in Maryland, Sarah in Texas, Nicola in the UK, where Peggy is also. Hello, Carolyn in Idaho. And hello to Brand not Birdie. Nice to have you today. I'm glad you're here. Birdie was with us yesterday for the first time. Glad you're back. Hello, Brian. Nice to see you today. Hello, Randy. Nice to have you. Hello, Sheila in Florida and Sheila's left-hand guy. Hello. Hello, Ethan and Ethan's right-hand gal. Nice to see you both today. Hello, Gary in Massachusetts and Janet in Georgia. Hello, Sue Sean. Nice to have you. Hello, Kathleen in Albuquerque. Hello, James in Tacoma Park and Dennis in Victoria, David in upstate New York, Jamie in Victoria, Karen in Arizona, Jim in New York City, Kathy in Virginia, Deborah in Kentucky, nice to have you with a beautiful sky behind you, Janet and Peter in Toronto, we're so glad you guys are both here today, Anne, nice to see you coming in from Maryland, Paula, great to have you today, and hello, Thomasina, glad you're back again, I think coming in from Baltimore, great to see you. And hello to Isabel in Florida, Doug in Vermont, Steve in Baltimore, Busy Graham, Carpe Diem Art, so glad you're here today, coming in from the Eastern Shore. Hello, Fred in Maryland, Kevin in New Hampshire. Hello, Belinda, nice to see you today, glad you've joined. Hello to Sandra and Mabel in Massachusetts. Hello to Bonnie in Idaho, Carolyn in Maryland, Sean, nice to see you, Anne in Minnesota, Lynn in Connecticut, Kim, hello, nice to see you today. For anybody who is new in the room to us today, a huge welcome to any new members of our community. And also please know you can stay at the end uh, to let us know where you found us and uh, where you're coming in from. It's great to actually get to meet new people face to face. Kate in Charlottesville, hello. Annette in California, Valerie in Kentucky, Dion in Mass, Harriet in Chicago, Jenny in Victoria, Dan in Vienna, Virginia, Trish in Victoria. Everybody take a deep breath, ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> no oh my laughing at me oh hello my to goodness yeah yeah it's really i'm getting a good calisthenic workout here hello to uh i see mr allen there nice to see you today and luda nice to see you wait uh, great to see you luda and kirsten in massachusetts hello to all right everybody's moving all around my screen like popcorn right now harriet elizabeth barbara Leslie and Kim and Peter and Sandra and Cricket and other folks not on video. So happy to see you today. Thank you so much for being here and welcome again to the Daily Antidote of Song. We are having a blast of a Women's History Month celebration these two weeks, first two weeks of March, um, before we start a great week of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center Archive Challenge Week. Um, and so please join us as we move forward through this amazing month of March. Um, which is also the last month of our first year of singing together um, as we'll celebrate as April starts our second year of singing together. So thanks so much gang for being here. I would like to uh, quickly note that the lyrics will be in the chat and that my email is always in the chat. If you wanna get on our daily antidote list, email me or anything else. 
And uh, there's also a link in the chat to our Facebook group if you want to join it. We do post a lot of info there. It's also a place where you in the community can all talk to each other. So I am now going to turn the floor over to the amazing Peggy Seeger, who's coming in from the UK and who really needs no introduction. She's been in this room with us a gazillion times. We love singing with her. Mostly we've gotten a chance to sing with her every month, which has been great. Although we've missed you lately, Peggy, we know you've been super busy and we can't wait to hear a little bit about all that busyness. Peggy Seeger, amazing musician, amazing activist, amazing female role model to so many of us in this room. Peggy Seeger, we cannot wait to sing with you. Welcome and love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just fabulous to be here. And, and thank you, Joe, for doing this. This has been an absolutely fantastic, I was gonna say venture, but I think it's more adventure for you. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, you've asked me to sing a song about, well, famous women. I think all of us older women are famous for getting old. Okay, it's been, it's been a real, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's better than climbing up Mount Everest, I'll tell you. I don't know if you've ever seen those lines of, of men, mostly men, climbing Mount Everest. Look at it. It's, it's honest to God. It's like, uh, it's like the lineup for Ma Madame Tussauds Waxworks in London. <laughs> unbelievable and very dangerous but anyway uh the song i want to sing is about all us invisible older women uh my son and i wrote it because he was complaining about feeling old and invisible at 61. when we worked it out it turned out that he was thinking that he was invisible to younger women you know that uh, I said, you're perfectly visible to us older women and to m older men. But uh, so <laughs> when he said he felt invisible, I said, How? try being 85 and a woman, you know. So this is a song I've wanted to write for a long time. And we wrote it together in about two hours. What a beautiful, beautiful baby, said the face looking down from the sky. A neighbor joined in and tickled my chin. What a beautiful baby was I. Growing up, I made sure of attention. Everyone's eyes were on me. And into my teens, I was never not seen. The whole world revolved around me, me, me. I was here for the birth of my children. I was here, the bell of the ball. Eighty years have gone by in the blink of an eye. Now it seems that I'm not here at all. Here comes the invisible woman. She's been on the planet for years. You can't make her out, but there's never a doubt the invisible woman is here. I strolled down the high street on Sunday in clown shoes and lace underwear. Did they notice my dance? Not one single glance. So I guess that I can't have been there. I can't recall when it first happened. Don't know how I became so unseen. How my tangible self was put on the shelf. These words on the label has been. Here comes the invisible woman. She's been on the planet for years. You can't make her out, but there's never a doubt The invisible woman is here Why do I feel so much less than I am? There's so much more of me now Gray hair, whiskers, wrinkles and such Dressing for comfort and longing for touch It should be so simple, it feels like so much To ask you to see me it's only a feature of nature you will start vanishing too you will get old left out in the cold the ghost army's waiting for you like the leaves that fall before winter like the day that turns into the night 
We may not have a choice, but we still have a voice. The invisible gals love a fight. Here comes the invisible woman. She's been on the planet for years. She has plenty to say. She won't go away. The invisible woman is here, here, here. The invisible woman is here. I forgot that that had a chorus. It's it's two weeks since I've sung it. So when I said you couldn't join in, oh, of course you can join in. That's what it was for. <laughs> and everybody was definitely joining in, and I loved it. Everybody picked it up very quickly, and it's so much fun. That song is so much fun. And where it really ends on that notion that the invisible woman love a fight is so great because I think I, I can speak only for me, but as I get older and wiser, I feel more as though I have the power to put up a good fight and <laughs> represent the people in our country who maybe need, in our country, in our globe, who need folks to fight with them because for whatever reason, they have less fighting power. And so thank you, Peggy, for bringing that to us. That was absolutely remarkable. And- um, Can I introduce Jean now? I would love that. Okay. Um, I don't remember when I first met Jean Friedman, but I do remember she came to our singers club over and over and she sang from the, from the floor. And uh, it was unusual. We invited her uh, home uh, to, to talk and, and we've been friends ever since. Now I'm talking about 50 years ago or maybe longer than that, Jean, I'm not sure. Jean has written several books. I think she's writing a novel now, I'm not too sure. Maybe I wasn't supposed to uh, say that, so keep it a secret. Uh, and then she came to me and said she wanted me to, uh, uh, to she wanted to write my biography, and I think Jean, you took about ten years over it, and it is such a good biography that when I wrote my memoir, uh, I, I had to go to Jean for facts about my life. She knew more about my life than I did, and so here she is, a good writer an excellent biographer, at least I liked it. I thought she did a wonderful job uh, and a, an excellent singer, Jean Friedman. Well, thank you. That was a lovely intro. I'm just, please excuse the shameless self-promotion. Well, that's what I used to look like. <laughs> this is the biography in question. I had a great deal of fun writing it. It took about eight years. Um, you can get it on my website. You can get it on Peggy's website. You can get it on Amazon. Okay, that's the end of the shameless self-promotion. Um, but Peggy may not remember the exact time when we met, but I do. It was October 1979. And I was in London uh, studying theater. And I saw in Time Out that Peggy and Ewan were going to be singing in um, Bloomsbury, in that little um, room above the Bull and Mouth pub. And yes, I introduced myself to her and... Uh, We've been talking ever since. So today we're going to be talking about women and folk song, which is a conversation that could last a couple of days, but we will keep it short because Joe wants me to sing at 12.35. So we have 20 minutes. Um, so Peggy, I know the, the subject of women and folk song has been a huge topic for you, both as women as singers of folk songs, women as characters in folk songs, women in your own songs. Uh, so um, I'm just going to start out with a very general question of when did, when did you first start to notice the importance of women in the songs you sang? I'm ashamed to say that it was after I wrote Gonna Be an Engineer. I sang shamelessly misogynistic songs, songs about women being killed without saying a word. Uh, I mean, Peter and I sang a song called, um, uh, and I, I occasionally threw this into an evening, kind of saying, isn't that ridiculous, but kind of, it was a laugh off. Um, what is it? Um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten this, I've forgotten its opening line, but if I remember it, <clears throat> um, golly. Uh, it was a song about uh, chopping a woman's head off if she didn't b behave herself. Do you remember that one? Yeah. 
And I, it's totally slipped out of my mind. But I'll, I'll sing it. No, I won't sing it. But we sang those songs. But when I did going to be an engineer, I got into the company. Oh, um, oh, I had a wife and got no good of her. Here is how I easy got rid of her. Took her out and chopped the head off her early in the morning. Seeing as how there was no evidence for the sheriff or his reverence, they had to call it an act of providence early in the morning. So if you've a wife and get no good of her, here is how you easy take rid of her. Take her out and chop the head off her early in the morning. That was a Puritan song. You know, uh, so I got, uh, it was, when I see how blind I was to it, I was, absolutely flummoxed completely i got in the company of feminists and learned about what was actually happening out there in the world so that was when i started getting interested so uh you probably know what date i wrote uh, gonna be an engineer 69 68 69 70 somewhere around there 71 <laughs> there you go <laughs> wonderful so that's pretty much when I started. And then I decided I've really got to get my finger out of the dam, you know. All right. And also, I'm thinking of a song that, that I used to sing, The Devil and the Farmer's Wife, which is about a woman so awful that the devil doesn't even want her, that when she comes down to hell, she terrifies all the devils. So women have... Um, have very interesting roles in traditional music. They can be strong and frightening. They can also be strong and sort of nice. And this is also something that you've talked about is that the, the, the roles that women take in Anglo-American traditional song, often the roles are, are stronger than you see in pop music or even in classical music. So you have songs like Tam Lin, in which the woman is the one who, who has all the power and all the strength. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about that, about women actually, the, the, the women characters in the songs? Well, they certainly show that they choose lovers of their own. They suffer for it, as in Matthew Grove. Uh, as in Child Waters, <clears throat> he puts her through a whole lot of tests or he, he turns his, uh, his back on her and then she bears his child and then he picks the child up and takes her in. Uh, there, it's, a, it's too big a question, Jean. It's far too big a question. But one thing is their stamina in holding on either for the person they love, as she does in Tam Lin, uh, or going through, as in Child Waters, going through the humiliation that he puts her through. Uh, they, even though they end up dead at the end, that 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 the, they often show a strength of love, and what they will do for love. Uh, th that's too big a question. It really is. All right. Let me see if I can narrow it down a bit. Um, can you talk about some of the um, when you first started getting interested? in this topic, some of the, the albums that you did of women's songs, some of them were of traditional songs, some of them were of your own, um, your own writing. So can you talk about that? Well, I, on the first one that I made, which is called Penelope Isn't Waiting Anymore, that was mostly uh, songs, uh, folk songs about women who are doing work or women who had <clears throat> had survived. Uh, 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 I'm trying to remember what was on Penelope isn't waiting anymore, but I called it a soft feminist album, which was very soft. It was squishy. Um, then I think I wrote diff Then I decided to take up different issues and write a song about each issue. And that's when I began, I think, to, to uh, find my feet. I can't remember what your question was, but uh, the songs that I sing about women are of various stages of women realizing uh, their power. But you, uh, the, the songs were often, I often felt that there were songs that were sung by women when there were only women present. 
But the problem was that they were mostly male folk, folk music collectors, and they're not going to sing these ones. The song The Bucking Bronco about Belle Star. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, next week, I'm, I do these shows on Sunday, Peggy at five on Sunday. And next week, I'm doing one about body songs, about double meanings. And the women are, <laughs> in, in old terminology, they'd say we have a dirty mind. But really, we have so many ways of talking about men and talking about their tackle, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's, and I think these songs have not been collected. I think there's probably a lot of them out there, women's songs about what women really think that haven't, haven't been collected. And probably a lot of the older women who haven't sung them to their granddaughters. Where did you get these songs? Uh, I got some of them from the uh, of co collections uh, by... Um, uh, the, the North Carolina, I have all those anthologies by state, you know, Illinois, songs of Arkansas, songs of this, songs of that, songs of the other. And uh, there are, they, they run through the, through the collections. And I'm sometimes wondering if the folklorists knew what the women were referring to because they're double meanings, you know. There's a wonderful one called The Young Virgin. I don't, you know that one. I am a young virgin, just come aboard. I have a envy of some maiden, has ever any young man took in his hand, besides I've twenty pounds in land. Then she runs through the ones who come after her hand. There's the chemist, there's the black blacksmith, there's the doctor, and each of them has something. I mean, the, the doctor says he has a lance that can open a vein with pleasure and ease and without no pain. Uh, and uh, the blacksmith who said his fire was hot and he wasn't afraid to hammer on the anvil of the fair young maid. Uh, these are songs which were, you don't know where they were sung, but they have been collected and there, there are a reasonable number. Of them. That's actually, that is a good thing for you to do. Go dig them up, make, make a book of them. I mean it, Jean. That's a fantastic project because they are there. It would be quite fun. And I think also of songs of complaint, like my husband has no courage in him, mm -hmm. in which the, the woman is complaining that the man is not quite up to the job, shall we say. So there, there are quite a, a lot of songs on these topics that women you know, were not, it was not considered proper in some circles for women to discuss these things. And yet you find them in the songs. So you find the, the women living in the songs in the way that they might not have been able to live in other portions of society, which is, which is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, again more about the songs that you wrote. You started, you say your first feminist song was, I'm going to be an engineer. Can you talk more about some of the other songs you wrote and the other issues that you addressed in your songs? Well... Having studied uh, with the in the critics group, which if you don't know about it, go to Jean's book. Uh, <laughs> here she comes again. It's a group that you and McCall and I formed, which began with us working with a number of English people uh, whose folk singers were all old. We didn't know how they didn't know how to sing them. Uh, and tended to sing them like classical music or like music hall. And so we were studying how to, what the style of singing uh, uh, was and, and maybe should be emulated. And that went into, we started songwriting with that. And we also looked at uh, pacing a concert in theatrical terms so that you sang songs of different types so as to keep people's ears awake by always a surprise in style. So when I did Different, Different Therefore Equal, which is my first uh, women's album that I'm really, I'm really proud of, I purposely styled each song differently. So when I wrote uh, the song Different Therefore Equal, it was light like a little kid song. Is a father better than a mother? Is a sister better than a brother? One's concave, one's convex. Does that make one sex better than the other? That's playful, you know. And then I wrote Reclaim the Night, which is virtually the story of, of rape that runs through 
uh, how we are looked at sexually, how we are looked at financially, and in terms of abuse, and in terms of economics, in terms of law. And it's a very close, tight uh, political credo. Uh, and I thought people would never sing that. I wrote it because I wanted to write it. I didn't write songs for people to sing. I wrote songs for me to sing. Uh, I think uh, I wrote a couple of uh, a union song or two. Uh, I wrote, I interviewed women and then wrote songs about their lives. Uh, I'm on the fringe. Uh, I'm not a popular songwriter as such. I'm somebody that, uh, in a way, the cognoscenti go looking for, that because I've written good songs, but they're not ones that are known by the general public. Uh, and there's so many in different styles, and I wrote them purposely in different styles. And I learned how to do that uh, because I learned a lot of music theory from my mother. I learned theatric theatrical theory from Ewan McCall. And then I, I added, you know, the songs are very different. I don't know if that answers your question, Jean. I, th I think it does, yes. Um... And I wanted to ask you, you mentioned your mother, and I wanted to ask you about her influence and the influence of other women on your music. The influence that my mother gave me was an innocence in singing folk songs. She, whenever she, she wasn't a good singer. And the, the fact that a project which she had taken up she now regarded as educating herself in folk music because she was a classical musician. And there she is transcribing folk songs for the Lomax books. And she was absolutely stunned by the songs and by the way of singing and by the fact that it didn't jive in with classical music. So she taught me that just by doing what she was doing, transcribing the songs in the corner while we played in the other corner. The other thing that she did, which is completely invaluable to me, was my classical training. You know, I was quite a good piano player at one point. I was up to three or four or five hours practicing every day. Brahms, Beethoven, Bach, Chopin, Debussy, Liszt, I played it. Uh, and I loved it, uh, but I, I didn't have the nerves for doing it. And I, I quit it because it was just too taxing. But... <clears throat> My approach is often, it, it reeks of my classical uh, history, and that can get in the way, but on the other hand, it helped me to do a number of different styles of, 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 and to know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly. Sometimes when I'm singing, if I'm singing a slow tune or something, I can just follow it on the, on the scale, on the, on the staff line in my head and I can transcribe songs. So it was a wonderful, those two sides from the lowest economic strata to the highest economic strata. The stuff in between I kind of lost and I grabbed little bits of it as it went by in my life. But I don't think I've, 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 I've written some songs that are kind of like the blues. I've written some rap songs. I've written some songs that are so far out of uh, the, like my one about Sandy Hook and my one about Extraordinary Rendition, uh, those are just like my mother. That, that's the kind of thing she would have done, you know. And also I think Different Tunes uh, has a, a legacy of your mother in it. And it was they all do. I think they all do. Right. Um, were there other women who were influential on you? As a musician? Probably without my knowing who they were because I listened to an awful lot of women singing uh, and I do now. Um, I don't think I could pl place one individually. I mean when I sang a song made up by Ozella Jones who was in Rayford State Penitentiary for life for killing her lover and recorded by the Lomaxes. And <clears throat> it's a song I sing very often called Bad Bad Girl. Ozella Jones was in prison for life and she just barely escaped execution. And so she made up this song and it was one of the ones my mother transcribed. 
and she sang it very high. I'm in a bad, bad girl. Wouldn't treat nobody right. She's like a little girl singing it, and I learned as a little girl. When I sing it, I sing it. I've been a bad, bad girl. Wouldn't treat nobody right. And I don't know where I got that idea from. Certainly not any other particular woman. I tried to imitate some of the the singers with the beautiful voices, you know, Mary Pickford, not Mary, not Mary Pickford, Mary, what's her name? Oh God, my brain has gone dead. Mary Travers? No, 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 way before her, way before her. The one who sang with Les Paul and Mary, Mary Ford, Les Paul, is that right? And uh, Margaret White, oh gosh. Don't, I've been trying to record all day, and and um, and I have a, a program that I have to do all by memory, and my, I find that I'm sometimes just panic because the things disappear. I kind of wonder about that too, but uh, I never copied another woman singer. Not really. I didn't have a good enough voice to do that. I'm a character singer. I'm a character singer. I copy what they. I feel they were thinking when they were singing. You're muted. How about now? Okay, so um, I think we're going to be wrapping up this discussion. Um, then I'm going to be singing a song. So Peggy, I want to ask you um, for some final thoughts about you know women and folk songs, if that isn't too broad a question. The importance of women in folk songs, the importance of women singers in folk songs. In a way, I'm having a problem with that because I don't sing so many folk songs. I don't go to folk song clubs anymore, not really. I mostly do concerts and I'll sing two or three or four folk songs on those. But I'm beginning to look on some of the folk songs like the statues of the slavers that are being taken out of uh, the streets of our cities because of the, the, the slaving of, 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 of black Africans than putting them in museums. I sometimes feel as if I'm a museum singer, uh, if I'm singing songs in which women are badly treated. I look on them as historic pieces. I look on them as traditional treasures. I feel they can't just be put away into books and you open a book and you look at it and say, isn't that nice? I feel that they need to keep being sung the same way as we keep playing Vivaldi. Uh, and he's not, he's not the flavor of the month for most people. Uh, but they are works of art to me. And they are works of art. Anything that the working class creates, unless it is for economic sale, like nuclear bombs and uh, plastic Madonnas, um, uh, th these are works of art that were created by by people who had no other voice and in a way it's the difference between art and craft we look up as the the fine art which is probably mostly created by men and women do crafts uh, the upper classes do um, music and and the lower classes do well what you know, folk music, which is often looked on as unskilled, uh, childish, uh, and the way we sing is often looked down on. They, they say we sing that way because we're not able to sing the way the classical people do. I mean, I've hit some incredible criticisms in, 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 in <laughs> about singing these songs. And I feel as if I'm preserving something that deserves to be to be kept alive and sung in honor to the people who made these songs. It was, it was the, the best they could do, and it was the best, really. And the fact that, that so many of these songs are about um, the upper classes, murder and mayhem in the upper classes, murder and mayhem because rich daddy doesn't want his rich daughter to marry uh, the drummer boy, <laughs> you know. 
there are so much class warfare in these songs that you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, and that in itself is worth preserving and talking about. So if I sing a folk song, I usually say something before it. This comes from a time and the importance of this is such and such. Yeah. All right, thank you, Peggy. That was an absolutely wonderful. Uh, Proustian sentence. Sorry? It was a Proustian sentence. A Proustian sentence. Well, you gotta have a Proustian sentence every once in a while. And it was a, it's actually an excellent introduction to the song I'm gonna sing because my, the song I'm gonna sing is an old song. And uh, like a lot of folk songs, its origins are obscure. It is probably the descendant of an old music hall song. And it's set in Ireland, but the first place it was published was in the US. So like most folk songs, it had no respect for national boundaries or even linguistic boundaries. It's been translated into other songs. And it's about a working woman, a peddler. And when I first heard the song, I remember thinking the, the lyrics are very light and even silly. But then you stop and think about it, and it's the story of a woman's life in three stanzas. And um, as Peggy said, these, these are the, the songs of, of working people. And so since this is Women's History Month, I'd like to dedicate this song to all the women who made history, but didn't always make it into the history book. It's a very simple song. Uh, some of you, probably many of you know it. If you don't, you will pick it up very quickly. Oh, it's called Molly Malone. In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. As she wheeled her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, frying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, frying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. She was a fishmonger, and that was no wonder, for so were her mother and father before. And they wheeled their wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, frying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh. Alive, alive, oh, frying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. She died of a fever, and no one could save her, and that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Now her ghost wields her barrow, through streets broad and narrow, frying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, frying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean, for that beautiful rendition. And thank you so much, Peggy, for bringing Invisible Women to us. That was both just two really great songs to sing today. Um, and uh, so I love the way Jean said the women who uh, may have made history but not made it into the history books. So one could argue that all of these songs, all of these ballads are in fact part of the history books, right? And they may or may not have their actual names with them anymore, but their, uh, their situations in some essence did make it into the history books, uh, just not the standard ones in school perhaps. Um, and Peggy, actually, if I can ask you one, 
a quick question before we move on um, to sort of get us out of all those historic statues that are being torn down. Can you chat for a moment about uh, any women right now out there uh, that you are being inspired by? Anyone who you see making some change or doing some great work? Well, of course, there's, there's Greta. She, I won't say she thinks like a woman, but in a way, I, it's her think, thinking like a child that is so fantastic. Um, there are <clears throat> uh, Caroline Lucas in this country, uh, in the Green Party. She was that she she led the Green Party for for a while, uh, and uh, now she speaks out. To me, anybody who speaks out about climate change is my woman, because that is absolutely it is a woman's issue. I mean, I know men do think about it, but there's more uh, women seem to be concerned with it in a way. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm noting that the campaign that I'm working on now, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the ones who are interested in the nature aspect of, of killing two fields for the sake of houses are, are mostly women. And it's the men who are talking about what kind of housing are we going to put on this? Is it going to be sustainable? Is it going to be whatever? Uh, in individual women, uh, well, Michelle Obama, of course, uh, uh, that's, that's excellent, really excellent. My mind is is, is blank. Uh, my mind has been filled today with a program that I need to record, and I'm really not all with it at at, at the moment. Uh, when we're talking, I will remember, but I'm, <laughs> my mind is just blank. And, but there's so many women who are do, <laughs> doing fantastic things. It's uh, absolutely. I, an I watched Jacinda Ardern down in New Zealand, and she is she is under constant attack from the other party, uh, and she is uh, she has done an unbelievable job of saving a country from COVID. My partner lives down there, and you can walk around in New Zealand without any mask, and you can go to funerals, weddings, anything, you know, and when, so, uh, but in this country, I'm sorry, my, my brain is gone, it's gone. So Peggy, you gave us a bunch of great answers, so out of a mind that you don't think is working came so much stuff for us to think about, and I love it, thank you so much, um, and uh, I will say we've been chatting a little bit in this room about Amanda Gorman, who's sort of, uh, you know, wonderful, yes, perfect she was so good and she looks good and she sounds good and it's all there if if, if you want to read some really funny women's stuff get um uh, uh carol ann duffy's book called the world's wives and that is a poem for each of the wives of uh quasimodo of king midas of all of the and of Icarus and all the men, it's their wives. A poem for how their wives thought. They are wonderful. The world's wives by Carol Ann Duffy. <clears throat> Thank you, Peggy. That's really great. And uh, uh, Aaron, if you don't mind sticking a link in the chat. Um, and of course, I always go on a little tangent about buying all your books from Bookshop.org, a great nonprofit that's actually funneling money straight to the local bookstores that need the support. So thank you so much, everybody, for all of the different ways that you are working to make changes little and big. Um, and thank you so much, Jean and Peggy, for the same. Uh, I do want to just call out a quick thing from the chat uh, that Sai Khan put in about a modern approach to the old barbaric pretty Polly. And he brought up a uh, uh, Sarah Lynch Thomas, um, which lots of folks in the room seem to know and which I'm gonna throw out as a challenge to Cy that maybe he and I together can work on getting Sarah into this room to sing that song with us. Um, so thank you so much Cy for the great idea. And uh, thank you so much to everybody in this room for being here. Thank you again to Jean uh, Friedman and to Peggy Seeger for singing with us today and chatting with us today. Can we please give them all a big thank you? And uh, I am going to say goodbye to the folks on Facebook Live. For anybody out there, if you're in there in the noontime Eastern hour, you can actually uh, come visit us here in this room still while we're in here for a few more minutes. Um, and otherwise, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at singing time. Uh, and uh, 
I see Carolyn is holding up another Peggy Seeger book. That's great. I love it, Carolyn. Look, oh, she's got the duo. <laughs> That's great. You're also a good commercial for Jean. Let's all give Jean and Peggy another thank you. And uh, thanks again, Facebook, for joining us and hope to see you tomorrow.